Hello, I'm Portia Young. Welcome to another edition of 1036 here on Milwaukee PBS. July 20th marks the 50th anniversary of the United States landing a man on the moon. Many of you have watched PBS's six-hour documentary series, Chasing the Moon, about the space race and the United States' first lunar landing. Milwaukee raised Captain James Lovell flew four missions to space, including Apollo 8. That was the first mission to orbit the moon and provided critical findings significant in the moon landing success. 1036 spoke with Lovell about his role in the moon landing and his Milwaukee roots. Okay, I'm going to leave that one foot up there and uh, both hands down about the fourth rung up. There you go. On July 20th, 1969, the United States landed the first man on the moon. That's one small step for man, one giant leap for mankind. That man was Neil Armstrong, but another astronaut named James Lovell and his work on the Gemini and the Apollo space programs contributed to the success of that historic event. How is the quality of the TV? Oh, it's beautiful, Mike. It really is. Oh, geez, that's great. Is the lighting halfway decent? Yes, indeed. They've got the flag up now, and you can see the stars and stripes. James Lovell Street in downtown Milwaukee honors Captain James Lovell. Growing up in Milwaukee instilled many of the core values Lovell would call upon as an astronaut and a naval aviator. He credits his days as a Boy Scout for providing a base for these values. Oh, scouting, I think, was the way to go. I didn't have a father. And so scouting really was a substitute father uh, because uh, my mother worked. I was alone most of the time and uh, I had to fend for myself. During these formative years, Lovell developed an interest in flying and rocketry that would lay the foundation for his life's career. I think it was the time that uh, I started high school. And sometime during that period, I got this pamphlet uh, from uh, this uh, professor in Worcester, Massachusetts. Uh, and uh, his name was Goddard, Dr. Robert Goddard. And uh, he started experimenting in rockets. And he suddenly just looked at combining liquid oxygen with various fuels, uh, gasoline or kerosene or something like that. You could get pretty good thrust that would, if in the right combinations and the proper builds, you could go to quite high altitudes to research the upper atmosphere. And I read this pamphlet and I thought, you know, uh, that is kind of interesting. And about that time, the German V-2 rocket was uh, suddenly, we were, we were uh, uh, capturing some of the parts of those V-2 rockets towards the end of the war. And after the war, while I was still in high school, uh, there was a, a, a group that came to Milwaukee, you know, to explore. And one of the things that they had was uh, the, the rocket uh, ahead of, the, of one of the rockets as an uh, uh, exhibition. exhibition. And, uh, and I was really, really enthralled with rockets. I wrote my term paper at, at the Academy on the development of the wicked fuel rocket. Lovell met his wife-to-be, Marilyn Gerlach, at Juneau High School. He attended the University of Wisconsin under the Flying Midshipmen Program for two years before transferring to the United States Naval Academy. He graduated in 1952. His wife, Marilyn, attended Wisconsin State Teachers College, now known as the University of Wisconsin-Milwaukee. She later transferred to George Washington University. The couple's Milwaukee roots served them well as they pursued their educations. In 1959, NASA began recruiting astronauts for the Mercury program. Lovell applied but wasn't accepted into the first group. 
Deke Slayton from Sparta, Wisconsin, was selected. In 1961, President John F. Kennedy proclaimed, I believe that this nation should commit itself to achieving the goal before this decade is out of landing a man on the moon and returning him safely to the Earth. The Mercury program began in earnest that same year. The plan for the first Mercury missions included man flying into space and orbiting the Earth. In 1962, NASA chose a second group of astronauts. This time, Milwaukeean James Lovell made the cut. As a test pilot, testing airplanes and then testing spacecraft is just an extension of the same career which was an opening, which was not a, uh, you know, uh, not given to earlier test pilots. And so, yeah, this was the, the way to go. And uh, since I had already uh, been very much interested in astronomy and space flight, before I knew there, were, there was a space program, it was just a natural follow-up. The Gemini missions expanded on Mercury and planned for a two-person manned flight the Gemini missions included spacewalking, ship rendezvous, and docking in space. Lovell flew on Gemini 7 and Gemini 12. Command pilot Frank Borman and Lovell set a flight endurance record of 206 orbits over 14 days. It was also the target vehicle for the first space rendezvous with Gemini 6A. After Gemini 7's successful mission, the people of Milwaukee honored James Lovell, his wife and family, with a parade and a full day of celebration. In addition to the parade, Lovell made several appearances, including at his alma mater, Juneau High School, Marquette University, and the Riverside Theater. It was really fantastic. I really appreciated everything and everybody in Milwaukee, and to think that, you know, uh, uh, Milwaukee at that time, of course, was uh, not the center of the space program, obviously, and, uh, but uh, to uh, honor somebody from, from the city and uh, watch the ticker tape parade and, uh, and that night uh, where I was honored at a banquet and gave a talk. And, you know, I, I really felt that Milwaukee was a great hometown. According to the Milwaukee Journal, Lovell said, quote, I didn't realize what a big day this was until I was riding down the avenue and saw on a theater marquee my name alongside that of James Bond. At that time, Lovell expected to remain on Earth for a while, but nine months later, he was back in space on Gemini 12. His second Gemini flight was with pilot Buzz Aldrin. Gemini flights paved the way for the Apollo missions. The engines are on. Four, three, two, one. Zero. We have commit. We have we have lift off. Lift off at 7:51 a.m. Eastern Standard Time. Apollo 8's December 1968 exploration directly impacted the moon landing, and Lovell was there. The whole Apollo 8 flight was necessary to have a successful Apollo 11. Uh, the navigation was necessary, going around the moon and seeing what the effects of the moon's body whether it was centralized or there were certain concentrations of, of inside the moon that would affect our orbit going around the moon. Uh, and the, the, seeing the moon just at 60 miles below, looking at the sea of tranquility, you know, looking at that. And, and of course, uh, we found the Triangular Mountain of, of Mount Maryland uh, there as the stepping stone or the initial point for the Apollo 11 landing. Uh, which, by the way, is now officially recognized by the International Astronomical Union. And so in perpetuity, years after I'm long gone, looking down at us on the near side of the moon was will be Mount Maryland. Lovell and his Gemini 7 colleague, Frank Borman, and William Anders became the first men to travel to the moon, orbit it, and pull out of lunar orbit for the return to Earth. Apollo 8 entered lunar orbit on Christmas Eve and made 10 orbits around the moon. The crew transmitted black and white television pictures of the moon's surface back to Earth. Transmission is coming to you approximately halfway between the moon and the Earth. Show you the Earth. It's a beautiful, beautiful view with uh, predominantly blue background and uh, just huge covers of uh, white clouds. Many people remember that trip. 
because the astronauts read the creation story from the Bible. For all the people back on Earth, the crew of Apollo 8 has a message that we would like to send to you. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the Earth. And the Earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. And God said, let there be light. And there was light. And God saw the light, that it was good. And from the crew of Apollo 8, we close with good night, good luck, a Merry Christmas, and God bless all of you, all of you on the good earth. Apollo 8 had the biggest impact on me. It had the biggest impact on me, uh, not from a technical point of view. I think uh, it prepared me for 13. Uh, and the two Geminis also gave me a lot of confidence. But when I was on Apollo 8, when, I, when we first circled the moon and the sunlight started to shine on the crest of the craters on the far side, which we have never, no one has ever seen before, absolutely, and we saw the, the far side of the craters and all looked around and we were, of course, like schoolboys looking through a candy store window, looking at all these craters compared to the near side. And then finally coming around and then seeing, seeing the earth come up 240,000 miles away the first time. And I could put my thumb up, and I've said this a million times in speeches and everything like that, but I, but I put my thumb up and I could hide the earth behind my thumb. Everything I ever knew three billion people, I guess, on the planet Earth at that time. Continents, oceans, you know, mountains, everything is behind my thumb. Uh, and I sort of figured out, how do I fit into this whole scene that I see here? And, and then I suddenly, suddenly remembered uh, a saying I heard years ago that uh, I hope to go to heaven when I die. And I thought about that. I hope to go to heaven when I die. And I suddenly realized that I went to heaven when I was born. I arrived on a planet, just the right size to have the right gravity to contain water and an atmosphere, the very essentials for life. And I arrived on a planet orbiting a star at just the right distance, not too far out to be too cold, in too close to be too hot, just at the right distance to absorb that star's energy, energy that caused life to evolve on Earth in the beginning. And then he sat to sort of think about that. And to me, I thought that God must have given mankind a stage upon which to perform. Okay, Houston, right. we've had a problem here. This is Houston, say again, please. Uh, Houston, we've had a problem. Apollo 13, during the flight, just before the explosion, I was recording uh, in the lunar module a sequence of things showing people what I was I had the TV camera and all this, it was a little TV program, and it was being sent down to NASA via telemetry. NASA then would, was feeding it out to all three networks. We didn't have Fox and CNN in those days. Nobody, nobody cared. You know, there was no interest. And suddenly, here's a spacecraft out, losing oxygen, 200,000 miles away. Oh, what are we gonna do? What's gonna happen? What's NASA gonna do? And, tremendous interest in the program, which kept itself over from Apollo 13 to the rest of the space program as to look at different things that we were doing. We've had a main beam plus undervolt. Roger, main beam undervolt. Okay, stand by 13, we're looking at it. We had a problem uh, on a test just before the launch, uh, which completely damaged the oxygen tank, which was not detected until uh, the takeoff on Apollo 13 on, the, on 13, 13 Central Standard Time. 
The explosion occurred on April 13th. I mean, this, this, this spacecraft was you know, plagued by bad things. And then, of course, on April 13th, what happened? They, the, the tank exploded. And from then on, it was one of survival. When the explosion first occurred, we didn't know what happened. We didn't know how serious it was. When I saw the oxygen escaping and, uh, and uh, suddenly realized, and looking at the quantity gauges, it's going down, and I could look out the window and see it actually flowing out, uh, I figured that chances were pretty slim. Uh, but uh, I knew that we had, that we were going to lose everything in the command module because we use oxygen to produce electricity, we lose all of our electrical power, and then we lose our, we lose our propulsion system too. So we knew we had to use the lunar module as a lifeboat to get home. But the lunar module, of course, <laughs> was designed for two people for two days. We were three people for four days, uh, but there was no choice. And uh, so into the lunar module with very uh, slim chance, but we thought to ourselves, we, we'll do the best we can. You don't give up until there is no more. Apollo 13 was Lovell's final mission. He retired from NASA in 1973. He's held numerous jobs in the private sector, including working for a telecommunications company. The Lovells' marriage survived the space program and life's ups and downs. They live in Lake Forest, Illinois, and enjoy the life they've built together. Sometimes they come back to Milwaukee to remember old times. I think the Milwaukee is a great city to grow up in, uh, and uh, uh, and my uh, some of uh, my wife's relatives are still there. And uh, we occasionally go back. Uh, and uh, uh, as a matter of fact, uh, uh, my wife and I were like to in our later days is to, just to take a trip up, uh, take a trip up there, and take a look at some of the old haunts. Ann Lovell does think about where space exploration should go next. Uh, I think the best thing that we can do really is actually go back to the moon. Now that it's there, now that we have landed there, build the infrastructure, the architecture, to comfortably go to the moon, land, spend time there, come back, learn more about the moon itself, only to build up confidence and expertise to go someplace else. Now there's talk about going to Mars. That is a big trip, and people sometimes think well, that's only about three days longer than going to the moon. Well, it's going to take a lot to go to Mars. But if we get ourselves comfortable and, and know enough about space flight by using the moon, then I think going to Mars is a possibility. Here, ma'am, from the planet Earth, first set foot upon the moon, July 1969, AD. It came in peace. Space travel certainly has changed a lot since James Lovell and company explored the heavens. We have an encore story that Milwaukee PBS's Sandy Max produced when she participated in the hashtag NASA social program. Sandy took her wide-eyed enthusiasm, a cell phone, and a selfie stick and set out on a space adventure frame of mind. Station, this is Houston. Are you ready for the event? Station is ready. The morning started with a live, interactive video session with the two American astronauts aboard the International Space Station, known as the ISS. On the five-story tall screen at Houston Space Center's theater, Peggy Whitson and Shane Kimbrough answered over a dozen questions about different aspects of living life in space for months at a time and the kinds of experiments they've been conducting. And I got to ask a question, too. What is the brightest light, natural or man-made, that you can see from the ISS that's on Earth? Sorry, we're trying to figure that one out. That's a great question. Um, <laughs> yeah, the, most of the big bright lights are in, in big cities, so there's nothing that stands out to me that I've seen and I'm like, oh yeah, that's that light or whatever. Uh, but it's all man-made, of course. The city as a whole kind of looks like, you know, the bigger ones are brighter than others. Um, sorry, I can't answer that one completely.
I'm kind of proud of myself. Stumped the, uh, stumped the ISS astronauts. Thanks so much. Keep up the great work. The rest of the day did not disappoint. I got a personal tour of the Space Vehicle Mockup Facility, a massive warehouse of a building. Robots, rovers, and the Mars capsule Orion are all being developed there. Then I got to explore the Neutral Buoyancy Lab, where astronauts train for spacewalks in this famous huge pool. It's also where essential space gear is developed. As you can see by this sign, spacesuit technology has been incorporated into the modern sports world here on Earth in football helmets, athletic shoes, and other sportswear. The day went on to include a visit to mission control that's used today to communicate with the International Space Station and the mission control of yesterday, the very room where the Apollo 13 crew's famous message, Houston, we've had a problem, was received. Okay, Houston, we've had a problem here. This is Houston, say again, please. Uh, Houston, we've had a problem. One of the highlights of visiting the Space Vehicle Mock-Up Facility was seeing the work being done on the Orion capsule that will eventually take a crew to the planet Mars. You get a real perspective on the compact quarters of the capsule and how extremely efficient and organized the equipment is inside. Weightlessness on the ISS and in space travel is a phenomenon that astronauts have to prepare for in a variety of ways. The best way is in the Neutral Buoyancy Lab, a 6.2 million gallon pool where astronauts get close to an environment of zero gravity by going underwater wearing special suits. A replica of the ISS is in the pool and astronauts submerge for as long as eight hours at a time to learn how to take spacewalks and how to make repairs while suspended in outer space. The Neutral Buoyancy Lab is also where space suits are developed and I got to try some of the gear on. And I have the glove on. Yeah. <laughs> Tell me about the glove, David. The glove has heaters in the very uh, tips of the fingers, and those are turned on via this switch right here. You pull this on, or you can pull it off. Okay. Cool. We have um, a palm bar, which is a rigidized bar in the palm here, in order to keep the glove from just ballooning out like a big balloon. And you can tighten that via this strap right here. And Think then we, of everything. Then we both go this back down. We have a tether loop right here that we can have what we call a re adjustable um, tether. So it's basically a strap with a hook on it that we can use to tether objects. So we can use that hook for this. And then inside here we have a harness and this connects to a wire that runs up the inside of your sleeve and then goes out to a battery on the suit that actually powers the glove heater. Just like David Barrett there of the Extravehicular Activity or EVA department, or astronaut Victor Glover you see here, everyone I met at NASA was willing to answer questions, from the very scientific to the one high on the curiosity list. But you're going to answer the burning question that everyone has. It takes hours to get in and out of this suit. So what happens when you have to go to the bathroom? When you gotta go, you gotta go, all right? This is a maximum absorbency garment, okay? It's gonna hold in whatever needs to be held in while you're in that suit. And now you know. Station, we are now resuming operational audio communication. I could have stayed in mission control and watched for hours how the NASA team communicates with the ISS and other space programs around the world. But there's something really special about the original mission control of the legendary space journeys of the 1960s. We started controlling missions since Gemini 4 in here, which is McDivitt and White, that was, a, that was the first spacewalk, was uh, by Ed White, first US spacewalk, was controlled out of this room, and all the Apollo missions. Now, during the Apollo mission, during those early missions, there was a flag that hung right where that flag is. And all through Apollo 11 through Apollo 16, um, that, that same flag hung there. And then just before Apollo 17, Gene Cernan came and got it. And they, they put a different flag up and Gene Cernan took that flag and planted it on the moon. So that's the one that's planted near the uh, uh, Apollo 17 landing site is the flag that used to fly here. And this, he took this, uh, Gene Cernan took this flag as well to uh, inside the uh, uh, lunar lander. Didn't go out on the surface of the moon, but has been to the moon. It's got moon dust in it. So Gene Cernan, when he delivered it to Mission Control, he said, this is my gift to uh, all those who got us to the moon and back safely. I left inspired in particular 
by the creative problem solving of this scientific community. Smart people who believe in science come together at NASA and in countries all around the world to collaborate on efforts like the International Space Station. The research that's being done at the ISS and in space travel benefits life here on Earth. So keep looking to the sky and dreaming about space. And if a NASA visit is on your bucket list, make it happen. You won't be sorry. We have one more space-related piece of information to pass along. Join Milwaukee PBS and the Milwaukee Public Museum on July 20th to celebrate Moon Day. Go to milwaukeepbs.org to find out more about this free event. That'll do it for this edition of 1036. Remember, check us out on Facebook and at milwaukeepbs.org. We'll see you next time.